Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second event in 2022 dedicated to energy transition organized by the Decarbonization and Energy Transition Committee of Spain Italian Section. My name is William Palozzo. I'm the member of the Decarbonization and Energy Transition Committee and uh, director of Spain Italy. This event is a part of the decarbonization program, which is the second step that was launched in 2020-2021 and was mainly focused on CCS and hydrogen biofuel technology. Starting from 2022, we launched a new program, which was it's called All Practical Step Towards Energy Transition, that is addressed to have four events. The first event we already had in January was addressed to microeconomics update and competence transition. Uh, then we have more three events which are more technical. And we start with this event we have today, which is uh, related to disruption technology. Then we will have another event uh, scheduled on May 2022, which will be addressed to the evaluation of assets in order to try to find solutions in terms of a circular economy related to the asset of the energy system. And then we will have the last events scheduled on September, where we'll discuss about energy storage and new, uh, new energy careers. Today, as I said, we are focused on disruption technology. It's the second episode. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize because our chairperson, Paul Garnevale, will not be here because it's actually he's in the uh, USA, he's involved in another meeting. So I will go on with a short introduction about the energy transition and then I will leave the floor to our speakers. The first is Stefano Pissolo from Susi Partners will explain us something about financing the energy transition and the role of venture capital to promote the disruptive technology. Then we will go through some more technical issue uh, with Francesca Ferrazza. Uh, she will explain the magnetic fusion game changer that can be can help us to solve the net zero equation. We hope so. And last we will be with uh, Alessandro Lavacchi. Uh, discussing about the futuristic project for electrolysis of waste biomass. Before we start, as I said, I would like to uh, spend a few words about energy transition. Uh, starting from the evolution of energy resources. As we can see from this chart, the energy sources, starting from fuel woods, then coal, we switch to oil, you know, we switch to gas, and actually, we are discussing about the interaction between these different sources of energy. So today, the first issue is to try the solution about transition starting from what we have today and what we are going to have in the future. The specific thing that we have today is that we have, for the first time, we are dealing with five main risk factors. Because we are just, we hope at the end of a pandemic, where the relationship between people have been uh, reshaped. Then we are talking about, we are facing war at the border of Europe between Ukraine and uh, Russia that will reshape the geopolitical uh, equilibrium between countries like Europe, Russia, USA, and India, China, and the relationship with Africa too. Then we have another issue, which is the raw material supply chain, the uh, strong shortage of raw material. And one of the action is to, for a lot of countries, to uh, reshore the industry in order to have the production close to the user and consumer market. Actually, we are also facing a strong energy crisis that even this will is, uh, is going on in order to let country thinking also to reshore energy source. 
to its own country. So as Italy is what's happening in Italy, we are discussing to produce more energy in our, uh, in our country. And last but not least, we are talking about inflection peak, which will create a, can create a big issue in terms of uh, social stability in each country. So energy transition has to be, has to go through all these constraints and they have to start to allow us to, to reach our target. The target we're talking about, and mainly the target that uh, is a general understanding uh, the, to stop the warming of our planet. We have to, uh, to decrease the use of uh, fossil fuel. So energy transition should be the tools to switch from fossil fuel to renewable and low, car low carbon fuels in order to reach the Paris Agreement, reducing the emission around 8% of each year basis. Uh, this is not a simple uh, game to play. It's urgent. Uh, it's simple because it's a challenge to rethink the entire energy system, you know, just to switch to, from one technology to another, uh, and to understand the relationship between different Independent in, independences of uh, technology. One thing is for sure, we cannot just think to one single technology to solve the challenge, but we have to think to let them all work all together. Uh, another thing that we understand is technology innovation, technological breakthrough for sure can ac accelerate energy transition. That's why today we are talking about, we we'll try to talk about some of these topics. But on the other side, there are also being concerned uh, about barriers to go ahead with this uh, innovation and energy transition. Uh, some barriers can be summarized like a uh, skills shortage, which is one of the issues we have tried to discuss internally, even in terms of SPE. Uh, the policy, which are set in place by the all countries, have to be aligned in order to let market to, to increase financing, which is one of the, the discussion we have this evening. Supply chain has to change in the approach and permitting, which is one of the many issues that, especially in the developing country, we are facing on a daily basis in order to unlock project. So the main question on how to uh, put in place energy transition are which are the technology that are driving the change in short and mid terms? So we we'll focus on technologies uh, in order to speed up this transition. And which disruptive, disruptive innovation are on track actually to help unlock the world's lower carbon future. So in a view, next future, we'll try to understand also which are these innov innovation that can we uh, look at. And this is one of the reasons we have to discussing today in this event. Going back to our uh, agenda, uh, today we are focused on two main points of view. We understand now that this energy crisis uh, is more important to the uh, clean energy startup and breakthrough technology, which are really under pressure to try to solve and to help the energy transition. And this acceleration of this speed up needs and require uh, more stimulus in terms of funding, broad collaboration between private and, uh, uh, and uh, government uh, policy and push up together to catalyze private investment at scale. So we have to start with, uh, let's say, uh, public funding, but we have to switch to private funding in order to let that this technology will be spread around the globe, scale up, and that can be independent in terms of development. Today, having this flow, we can want to analyze how structural funds, venture capital, corporate research and development departments, research center and university can work all together in order to find new disruptive technology. Uh, before we start, I would like to remind you that uh, you can ask questions compile, compiling a form on the Google. Uh, you can click on uh, just down the YouTube page. 
you can find the link, you can just click and then you can compile the form in order to uh, address a question if you want, one of each speaker or whoever you want. So now let's start uh, with the, the first speaker, which is uh, Stefano Vissolo. Stefano is an investment director at Susi Partner, which is a Zurich-based firm, uh, which is involved in finance and energy transition and sustainable energy infrastructure. Before joining Susi Partner, Stefano was a manager part of Solesa, involved in renewable energy and energy efficiency project in Italy and in the Oman and Kenya. Before to start with Solesa, Stefano works as a project manager at Early Guild Engineering and Construction in Paris and also at Boston Consulting Group in Milan. Uh, Stefano has a degree in engineering physics in Turin and has a two M MBA in Paris and in Switzerland. Now, Stefano, the floor is yours. You can start with your uh, speech. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, for the invitation. Uh, just to check whether you can uh, hear me. I will then launch my few slides. So I I have actually used the template of Susi Partners, uh, but uh, the slides are personal slides uh, just made for the occasion, uh, uh, including some charts. Uh, taken from different sources uh, and I try to diversify <laughs> the sources in order to actually uh, show different maybe uh, point of views uh, uh, in, in the market. Uh, let me start with a disclaimer. So, um, you know, we work uh, as an institutional player with pension funds and we always like to start our presentation with disclaimers. Like in this case, the disclaimer is whatever I will show you is somehow data uh, coming from before the Ukraine war and uh, and it's unclear how uh, the Ukraine war is actually going to change the uh, the situation on the short term and on the long term my personal assumption uh, is that the long term situation will not change uh, while uh, most probably on the short term there will be some deviation from uh, you know what the market expected uh, the energy markets expected the situation to 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 evolve uh, until you know a few months ago. So clearly, uh, COVID has been seen in the sector in the sector where I belong as uh, uh, you know one uh, pretty big uh, uh, you know occasion opportunity to boost uh, the energy transition thanks to the recovery packages that have been approved mostly in the in the rich world and. Uh, and this is currently at stake uh, due to the you know the Russian imports of uh, of gas and oil, uh, but uh, uh, we hope this lose lose situation uh, lose situation clearly for the violence and the crimes and also lose in terms of you know emissions uh, is not going to last uh, too long. Now jumping into the matter, uh, what we like to to think uh, uh, as. Uh, energy transition financiers is that uh, uh, to understand the sector, you just have to follow the money and see where the money is being spent, where the money goes. Uh, before looking at where the money goes, let's look at uh, what is the expected return of the different, uh, uh, the different energy sources. And this is probably the best explanation for the tailwind that has been sustaining uh, the energy transition since, I would say, um, the late 2010s, uh, where you can see here, I mean, not only that clearly expected returns for fossil fuels are higher than uh, than for renewable energy, but also that while uh, expected returns for um, for fossil fuel are volatile, for renewable energy they are pretty much uh, steady and declining, which means that in a, a demand and supply driven economy there is a huge demand uh, for uh, uh, renewable energy and energy transition projects. So the actual reality on the ground is that there is a huge amount of capital chasing too few projects. 
uh, and uh, and that's why the cost of capital is uh, so depressed. And this will continue, we think, uh, for the next foreseeable future. And uh, with that tailwind in mind, let's see where the money is being spent. And you see here on the top uh, that the money is primarily spent on renewable energy, so wind and solar. And uh, starting with 2019 and going forward, uh, also on the electrification of transport, so e-mobility and alike. That's where the majority of the money is spent, and that's where the majority of the energy transition will happen, just because that's where most of the money is spent. Um, and, uh, and then since we're talking about venture capital today, uh, on, at the bottom of the slide, you also see uh, the venture capital component, which is what it's called climate tech corporate finance at the bottom uh, in the bottom chart. So basically why on the left you have these energy transition investments, which are the investment made by structural players, uh, players like Susie Partners, investing in projects and deployment of uh, uh, green technologies and green projects. Uh, in the middle, climate tech corporate finance, you have innovation, comp innovative companies that are raising uh, money either through venture capital or growth equity or public markets. So IPOs, SPAC. You know, we can observe the vast majority of the money is spent on actual deployment of projects, uh, but we also expect the, um, the, the innovation part to uh, pick up and uh, increase significantly in the next years. In terms of breakdown, you see that, you know, again, to the right, you see, if you see the legend, uh, it's always the renewable energy, electrification of transport, and also in the innovation part, it's uh, energy and transport and mobility. The rest is not is not unimportant, but it's not where the majority of the money of the money is spent or invested. And that leads me to the second principle. So first principle is uh, follow the money to understand the energy transition, and the second principle is do not bet against the beast. What is the beast? The beast is uh, basically solar and wind. So you can see here. Um, the annual capacity installation uh, of uh, new uh, generation electricity generation assets from 2001 to 2020 uh, in gray the new capacity non renewables in gigawatt and in blue the new capacity renewables renewables that does not include nuclear so you can see that basically the penetration of renewables in the new generating capacity is as cheap 90% uh, nine out of 10 gigawatt that are put in place uh, greenfield in the world today are solar and wind. And then if we look at uh, um, what, uh, where does looking at the future, the reduction of annual CO2 should come from, again, the chart is a bit complex. I wanted to put the, the IA, the National Energy Agency, instead of Bloomberg, not to use always Bloomberg. The Bloomberg chart is uh, similar, but a bit more sexy in terms of graphics, but uh, I, I wanted to use another source. So now you, we have the IEA, which is not easily readable, but you can read the, the legend. The legend saying renewables and electrification made the largest contribution to emission reductions. Again, always the same story. Uh, the market expects, investors expects energy transition to be delivered through electric cars, solar, and wind. And then obviously there is other stuff, uh, hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, um, biofuels, uh, and uh, this is all supposed to play whenever the beast, solar plus uh, EV charging plus wind, uh, do not have a role. So hard to abate sectors like, uh, you know, uh, hard manufacturing uh, or shipping or uh, you know heavy transportation sectors where the simple uh, you know constell combination of uh, solar batteries and uh, AV charging would not make the work, um, and we'll see later uh, examples of those of those transactions. Uh, still staying on the beast for a second, there there is a. Probably you all know this, but uh, I wanted to, to to touch base on technology because venture capital is where finance meets technology. So it's good to talk about technology. Why the be why renewable energy is uh, basically uh, uh, the beast in the market because uh, of the learning curves. So 
you we can see here in the chart is that the predictions that have been made over time on the capacity additions and on the cost reductions for solar, wind and batteries have significantly underperformed, meaning reality is always better than forecast. Or historically, the reality has always been better than the forecast. You can see just as an example, solar PV here in 2002, this was the expected evolution of the market. In 2010, this was the expected evolution of the market. In 2020, the market uh, is actually evolving 36 times more or uh, uh, at a higher pace compared to the initial predictions 20 years ago. Uh, same for wind, same for batteries. Why? Because the learning curve of those uh, uh, sources is dramatic. Uh, the cost uh, reduction per uh, increase of market size is uh, phenomenal. And it's similar to what has happened to the electronics industry. Uh, it's very easy to understand if we compare it to, 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 to solar, because solar, in, solar PV is made of silicon, which is the material of processors and basically semiconductors. So the sim a similar story is happening to what has happened to electronics. In electronics, uh, the cost of a megabyte, the cost uh, of a transistor has uh, constantly been uh, reduced over time, thanks to R&D and thanks to the learning curve in, in production. Same is happening for uh, for renewables. I remember in 2010 when I joined the sector, uh, I heard for the first time this, uh, let's say, uh, um, acronym or not acronym, this, uh, this uh, uh, principle, do not bet against the beast. In a conference in Munich, at InterSolar Munich, basically they were discussing whether in the future solar PV would be based on uh, silicon wafers or on uh, thin film. You may remember back then, Think Film was a very big thing. Venture capitalists invested into Think Film technologies, and uh, the expectation was that by today, half of the market would be actually using a Think Film uh, solar photovoltaics. Well, guess what? Today, 95% of the total production of solar PV is based on silicon and uh, it's going to stay like that. So if I have to use the same, uh, uh, let's say the same example for uh, batteries. Everybody is talking about new technologies, but most probably lithium is going to stay with us for a long time. Um, now, the good news is that our life, meaning fighting climate change and the 1.5 to 2 uh, degree scenario of the Paris Agreement depends on existing technologies. This is pretty good. Uh, so we don't have to reinvent, let's say, or to bet on massive technological breakthroughs in order to solve the problem, tackle the issue. Uh, well, the bad news is that we're not doing it enough. Uh, and that's uh, the, the message that was given yesterday by uh, the IPCC Council, by the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, uh, I just copy paste an article here. Uh, now or never is basically what Antonio Guterres said yesterday in order to put in place those, uh, you know, technologies that exist today. Again, solar, wind, batteries, uh, electrification of it with heat pumps and things like that. And the good news for investors like us is that the appetite for uh, additional private money is bound to increase. So what you have on the right is a chart which actually has been uh, compiled internally at SUSI, and you see where we expect the capital to be required in the next 30 years. Uh, basically, a lot in energy efficiency, a lot in renewables, and a lot in electrification of heat and transport. Um, with a gap compared to what has been planned today by the providers of this long-term capital, which uh, means that there is still space for more players to come and join the party and uh, help uh, help uh, the world progress towards you know the objective of uh, uh, limiting the uh, the temperature increase if we look on the very short term this is the 10 point plan of the IEA on reducing european union reliance on russian natural gas and uh, probably you cannot read it very well but i try to highlight in red circles uh, existing technologies uh, compared to sorry technology uh, 
um, incentives or measures compared to behavioral measures, you know, or contractual measures. So the IA is clearly mixing, you know, no new gas supply contract with Russia or behavioral changes uh, like uh, reducing the temperature in the apartments with uh, speeding up deployment of existing technologies. All it's based on, of, on existing technologies. And the four topics that I circled highlighted are maximizing generation from existing dispatchable low emission sources, bioenergy and nuclear. Second, accelerate the deployment of new wind and solar projects. Third, speed up the replacements of gas boilers with heat pumps, which is the electrification of heat basically, and then accelerate energy efficiency improvements in buildings and industries. Uh, so long term and short term seem to actually hint to the same direction, which is do more of what exists today. Now, but I don't want to forget, you know, that innovation still plays an important role because uh, technological innovation uh, is can basically provide the gap, this gap that we saw before to actually really reach net zero and reach it in a short time. And so this is where venture capital money has been flowing last year. Uh, you cannot see much other than the fact that it's mostly energy and transport, as I said before, with a little bit of agriculture. Uh, and uh, and the way it has been uh, invested is mostly venture proper venture capital, late stage and early stage. You can see it at the bottom and the bottom part of the slide um, with, you know, other alternative sources like crowdfunding picking up. Um, since uh, the breakdown is not really uh, relevant for our purposes. Uh, I looked at the uh, venture capital num number one in this sector, which is breakthrough energy ventures. And uh, uh, this is probably, uh, as you as you know, uh, the uh, an initiative uh, put together by Bill Gates with other billion American billionaires. And uh, uh, what Bill Gates did, first of all, was to change because let's not forget that Bill Gates plays in the same space of others where the cost of capital is very low. Remember the first slide. So Bill Gates is a philanthropist, but he also wants to make money. So what he, what he, need, what he did, first of all, he changed the paradigm. And instead of, uh, you know, uh, showing the CO2 emission that we are used to, as you can see on the right, uh, where energy plays the big part, and that's why everybody focuses on energy, he has basically decided to look at the problem uh, from an end use perspective, rather a demand perspective of energy rather than a supply perspective. So uh, the idea behind this uh, venture capital is to give, let's say, dignity to things like agriculture with 19% of emission and uh, manufacturing with 31% of emission. Actually, according to his breakdown of the CO2 emissions, uh, most of the emissions come from manufacturing and not from energy. Again, it's just a question of definition. The total is always the same. It's 51 uh, giga uh, tons of CO2 emitted per year. Um, but by doing that, basically, it allows the venture capital firm that he basically has sponsored to look a bit beyond the traditional renewable energy. So what I did here, and this is the last chart, uh, is just to map all the deals that this venture capital has done, 60 companies in which they have invested uh, on, on two axes. On the rows, you have uh, these uh, uh, grand challenges that uh, Bill Gates uh, calls, uh, and those are simply the CO2 uh, emission components. So number one, making things, manufacturing, number two, plugging in, electricity, number three, growing things, agriculture, number four, getting around, transportation, and number five, keeping warm and cool buildings. And on the columns, you have uh, technology buckets. Now, not, prob not properly technologies, those are more themes, uh, like electrification of it, transport, renewable energy, energy storage. And where you, where you see the most of the deals happening is clearly in IoT AI, in terms of technology team. So this is a venture capital firm. And since it's a venture capital firm, it's scalability and uh, venture capital firms, they know IT and software pretty well. So it's not a surprise they invest a lot in software solutions. Uh, they also invest a lot on plugging in, in terms of CO2 components. 
And why is that? You see 21 deals made in, in the plugging in uh, grand challenge. Uh, why? Because it's the technology, as I was showing you at the beginning, where the most of the money is flowing and where people are comfortable because there is track record, there is data, there is a clear evolution. People expect uh, a specific evolution of, uh, of, of the market uh, without big surprises. There is also an agricultural spot with eight deals done in plant-based meat and biotechnology and, uh, and then energy storage. Uh, which with with eight deals in particular lithium production, and uh, with that I think uh, I can stop here and I'm happy to take to take questions later on obviously. Okay, thank you, Stefano. Uh, thank you for your really clear and comprehensive presentation. We have an idea now. Always the, the, the money moving today and be in the future. So it's uh, very interesting to understand which will happen in the future according to what technology can provide to, to the people that want to invest. Uh, now let's go back to presentation. Okay, so now uh, let's move to the next speaker, uh, which is Mrs. Francesca Carrazza. Uh, Francesca is head of Magnetic Fusion Initiative in, in ENI. Uh, it's in charge of supporting the development of fusion technology and project. She has also the ground in semiconductor physics and other and has over 30 years of experience in applied research in R&D management. She is also a member of the main national international scientific committee and working group, and also has published on uh, many journals and conference articles and papers, book, chapter, and is co-inventor of patents in the field of photovoltaics. Uh, now, Ferrara, uh, Francesca, the floor is yours. And let's start with your presentation, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'll just uh, share the presentation. Can you can you see it? Um, not yet. Um, can you see it now? Not yet. Oh. Uh, well, to my knowledge, it should be in. Uh, in... Oh, yeah. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So, is it in presentation mode now? Okay. So, um, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I'll, I'll talk about our activities on uh, on uh, fusion energy, on the development of fusion energy. Um, as a company, we have a, a strong decarbonization strategy, uh, and uh, it resonates a lot with with what was uh, told by the the previous speaker. Uh, we have a commitment to decarbonizing our um, our portfolio uh, by 2050 with a sustainable mix of energy. Uh, we are committed to renewables, to biomass, to biofuels, to hydrogen, to CCS, and to circular economy, and this is happening now as part of our strategy. But then for a longer term, medium to long term strategy, we are also committed to, uh, to fusion, to magnetic confinement fusion, as a, a source of, uh, of, uh, of energy, which is breakthrough. Uh, and uh, in a path that uh, manages the technical risks through validation of innovative te technologies. Um, the uh, aim is to, um, to, to realize a compact fusion energy power plant, which is commercially exploitable in a, uh, in a, in a reasonably short time frame, less than 15 years. Uh, and, and this is 
an acceleration compared to what um, what is traditionally proposed for for fusion. We really think it's a breakthrough technology, and uh, we have uh, committed to um, demonstrate uh, that uh, net energy can be produced in the mid of this uh, decade, so by 2025, and that it's possible to realize the first working power plant by the early, the early 2030s. And this um, is through the investment uh, with our venture capital uh, partner, NE Next, um, in a, in a spin-off of, uh, spin of, of, of MIT, building on known scientific principles uh, so, known science from previous experience, especially at MIT with, uh, uh, with the experience on Alcat or CMOD, and innovative technology. Um, the innovative technology is based on uh, a new class of superconductors, super, superconductors which can reach high fields. And this means that it's possible to compact the design of the reactor and make a, a modular and fairly small kind of, uh, kind of uh, power plant. Um, now, the investment for us is, is, uh, is strategic and it's not only financial. So we, we, are, we are developing skills, technology and supply chains for magnetic fusion in, in an active way. So we have a, a unit, a dedicated unit, um, a, which has engineers and uh, and uh, looks also to innovation and R and D and uh, and project management and we are uh, involved and contributing to some of the development of uh, of the spin out in which we invested which is called uh, Commonwealth Fusion Systems CFS uh, and which foresees as as I said two main steps the demonstration of uh, um, of net energy. Uh, Net, net, net energy by the 2025 and and the uh, and the power the power plant by the early 2030s. But apart from this, we we have also invested in a joint venture with uh, Enea to build uh, a an experimental plant called VTT Diverter Tokamak Test, uh, which has the main objective of studying the um, the diverter, so the the the, the heat. Uh, the heat uh, part of the of the system. What is important uh, is uh, the timeline that uh, that we propose and that which we have as target in terms of technologies of the plant of the power generation that uh, we want to demonstrate with fusion. We know it's complex. We know it's complicated, and we have um, a path which goes through technology development with uh, with a uh, academy uh, here in Italy and uh, in the US. In Italy, there's a strong uh, technological and scientific um, community uh, uh, in fusion. And so we're doing basic research and advanced modeling with the National Research Council and with MIT, with the aim of, of course, finding solutions, accelerating in innovative technologies, and also de developing competences because um, skills and people are obviously key to to the one one of the key fa factors of the success of the of the sector and the, of the technology uh, the uh, the work we're doing with uh, with an uh, is a is an engineering project uh, uh, in order to develop the skills and understand the key factors in terms of uh, HSE for for instance uh, what what is needed for a plant and this is what we are doing with Enea in, in Fascati, near Rome. And it's uh, de-risking and a, a sort of engineering kind of approach to, to, to get to the right skills and the right um, timeline for, for development. Uh, the industrial pilot plant itself will, uh, will, will have to demonstrate net and ener positive energy, as, as I said, and at the first industrial power plant. And uh, the, the, the timeline we, we, we have is, is fairly short. Uh, now, the first milestone was the development and the testing and the demonstration that um, the new superconductors could 
uh, be fit into a magnet, demonstrating the high field 20 Tesla. And this was done in September 2021, uh, validating the, the approach of a compact uh, reactor chain, so, chamber. So the, the demonstration plant, uh, which I've mentioned, is under construction in, in the US. And uh, as a company, we're con contributing to, uh, to its development. Uh, in the meanwhile, we are working uh, here in Italy, but also in the US for, for the, um, uh, the main goals of, uh, of demonstrating uh, a high field, compact, uh, continuous and prof profitable production of, uh, of clean energy. Now, we, we, know, uh, we know there are many unknowns, at least we know which, which they are. Um, so if you ask me, what do I think of, uh, of fusion being a game changer for solving the net zero equation? Well, I say, I say yes, uh, it, it can be a game changer. Uh, there's still quite a bit to do. Um, and this does not contradict renewables or other forms of energy because we need all of the above for the net zero equation. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Francesca. Also, you were a very interesting uh, presentation because it's, uh, I was very curious to understand your, your idea about this uh, new technology that the world is, is looking at that can be the game changer for, our, for the future of our planet. Now, let's move to the next presentation uh, speakers and to, again to share the screen. Now we are moving to Alessandro Lavacchi, who is a senior researcher at the Institute of Organometallic Chemistry of the National Research Council in Italy. He is also head of the electron microscopy facility. His research has focused on development and characterization of nanomaterials for electrochemical energy conversion and storage, with a focus on alkaline membrane electrolyzer and biomass conversion in electrochemical devices. In his career, he co authored more than 120 scientific papers and uh, monograph for new technology in electrocatalysis for energy. Lavacchi is also chief editor of coding edited by MDPI and editorial board member of Electrochemical Energy Review edited by Springer. Uh, Alessandro will talk about the futuristic project for electrolysis of waste, uh, waste biomass. So, Alessandro, the floor is yours. Let's start with your uh, presentation, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, William, for your kind introduction. Um, do, you, do you hear me well now? Yes. Well, okay, so I start sharing my, my screen now, and uh, so we can we can begin the, uh, the presentation. Okay. Okay. So uh, the subject I'm covering today, uh, it's uh, a, very, uh, a very novel one. And it goes in the direction of uh, creating a nexus between green hydrogen production and uh, the production of important raw chemicals for our society. Um, the idea is to make both processes completely decarbonized uh, because uh, it's true that the energy sector is for sure one of the most uh, contributing to the production of uh, CO2 and greenhouse uh, gases, but on the other side, chemical industry is another uh, very important contribution to this contributor to this to these aspects. So um, lately, uh, even the European Union uh, has focused much on uh, creating uh, on I mean uh, pushing for creating new uh, technologies for making chemicals production entirely uh, decarbonized. 
Um, so uh, at ICOM, that is my, my institute in, uh, in Florence, we are working on this subject. Uh, and we started this activity more or less 10 years ago when nobody was, um, was thinking about this, uh, this possibility. And uh, I must mention that uh, at the beginning, what we did was uh, pretty much uh, not considered by the uh, scientific community. Uh, there has been a big boost in 2017, 2018, when people started to realize that these uh, electrochemical processes to combine hydrogen production and uh, chemicals production uh, could find uh, an important place in the uh, decarbonization of, uh, of our society. Uh, so um, just to, uh, to go a little bit more technical, I think most of you have uh, had the chance to uh, learn something about electrolysis uh, electrolysis is just the process that splits water in H2 and O2, and uh, it does this uh, with uh, electrical power supply. So um, this is, uh, I think, the most relevant technology in clean hydrogen production uh, so far, and uh, the paradigm toward the complete decarbonization of the society envisioned by the Green Deal uh, actually uh, fix the target of completely decarbonized society by 2050, heavily rely on uh, the production and the exploitation on green, uh, of green hydrogen. And uh, this production is mostly um, uh, by electrolysis and the plants are to go uh, to the terawatt scales by uh, 2050. Well, uh, this is for sure a, a big opportunity, but there are a few issues about uh, deploying electrolysis at this scale. The most performing uh, technology at the moment is polymer proton exchange membrane electrolysis that uses large amount of iridium, uh, which is a very rare element and might pose a severe uh, threat to the um, possibility of uh, really uh, uh, deploying the technology at the terawatt scale. Uh, scale. So, um, but by the way, apart from these, and many studies are going uh, on to reduce the loading of these critical resources, uh, electrolysis is a very solid technology that might be, might be uh, well considered for a massive, for a massive deployment. Well, in, in our lab, uh, 10 years ago, uh, we decided to avoid the evolution of oxygen in electrolysis. Evolution of oxygen is a big issue uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, one is that oxygen is not a high added value product. So um, it's, it's something we're going to waste uh, in most of the cases in air. And uh, uh, so we decided to cut this oxygen evolution and to uh, replace it with the oxidation of biomass. Uh, means organic compounds and particularly alcohols. And these alcohols are extremely easy to be oxidized, much easier than water. So this in principle can cut very much the um, energy consumption of, uh, of water or water electrolysis. So you see these two schemes here. On the left, you have the PEM electrolyzer with the uh, H2 production and the O2 evolution. And on the right, you have the electrochemical former that oxidizes H2 and then oxidizes biomass, uh, uh, sorry, that uh, reduce water at the cathode to produce H2 and oxidize water, uh, biomass at the anode to produce this oxidized biomass. Uh, so if we use alcohols, in many cases, this oxidation may lead to the formation of very important chemical compounds with very high added value and actually also uh, bulk and raw chemicals. So it's something that uh, has a huge potential to impact on, uh, on the challenge for challenges for 2050. This is an example of what we can do with electrochemical reforming. Uh, so aside of the H2 evolution, if we use ethanol, for instance, from biomass fermentation, 
we have the opportunity to produce acetaldehyde and acetic acid. Acetic acid is produced uh, nowadays with the Monsanto process or the Cativa process uh, by uh, Johnson Matte. And uh, these two processes are actually uh, pretty uh, problematic in terms of rare resources and also in terms of energy demand. Uh, so um, the opportunity to get these two compounds with, a, with an electrochemical process that works at room temperature and uh, using basically known toxic compounds, it's, it's, it's I think, absolutely very appealing. Um, we are also exploring the possibility to, uh, to use glycerol that we get from uh, the scraps of biodiesel production, for instance, uh, and uh, with a variety of pretreatment, we can feed the uh, electrolyzer to get uh, chemical compounds of extremely relevant uh, role in our society. And you see here, for instance, the acrylic acid, which is a very important monomer for the uh, preparation of polymers. But on the other side, we can also get lactic acid, also very important for the fabrication of PLA. Uh, so uh, that is a very good candidate, uh, I mean, as a renewable plastic. So uh, we have very many opportunities to get, to get these compounds. Well, um, what is the uh, technical performance of, the, of this device? Because we know that electrolysis is a, is a very high intensity process for the hydrogen production. Uh, it works at two amp on square centimeter. For those uh, who are not familiar with this, with this quantity, two amps on square centimeter is, is truly a lot. So it means that uh, just pretty small devices can, can, can produce uh, significant amounts of, uh, of hydrogen. So this is what we want to maintain, this high intensity, because it's the key for successful processes. And uh, it turned out that uh, from our experiments, electrochemical reforming is actually a very high intensity, uh, a very high intensity uh, process. Uh, that can compete with the state-of-the-art uh, polymer uh, electrolyte membrane uh, electrolytic technologies. So if you see here, uh, there are very interesting data. So if we consider the uh, electrical energy input of the reaction that leads to the oxidation of these compounds and to the production of hydrogen, we see that uh, compared to the conventional water electrolysis, we have an electrical energy consumption of 47 kilowatt hour per kilogram of produced hydrogen. While we are more or less around uh, 18, 19 with electrochemical reforming feed with, uh, with ethanol, with the added value um, of the production of acetate in alkaline environment or acetic acid in uh, acid uh, environment. So uh, basically, we have a recipe to, uh, I mean, to deploy this this nexus between hydrogen production and chemicals and chemicals production. Uh, from these curves here, we see that the, the the energy input is extremely small compared to water electrolysis. Consider that the operating cell potential at even current density. Uh, in, um, I mean, in electrochemical reforming is more or less uh, 60% less than, uh, than, water, uh, than water electrolysis. So this opens up to a new business model for uh, clean hydrogen, uh, and uh, which we mean uh, not to be uh, completely, uh, I mean, it, it's not something that is going to substitute electrolysis but it's something that might complement electrolysis. And the idea basically is that we can supply the biomass to the, um, uh, to the plants, which can be either relatively small, I'm sorry, this is a mistake, it's not 10 kV, uh, 10 kilowatts, it's something less than one megawatt. So it's, it's a small plant that can be um, close, for instance, to a refueling station that can fit trucks, uh, for instance, and it's fed by, uh, uh, by renewable energy. So uh, the, 
the model um, consider that we can derive, we can obtain this H2 for transportation, and then we can collect the exhaust reformates from the electrochemical reforming and then uh, treat this reformate to get, to get the, the chemicals. Uh, then we can also deploy this technology in the context, for instance, of a biorefinery and big plants with more than 10 megawatts. And here we have, uh, again, the opportunity to transform in situ this exhaust reformate into chemicals and to provide H2 uh, for, uh, I mean, stationary and transportation uh, use. What is interesting here is that since clean hydrogen is pretty expensive, with this model, we actually have the possibility to share the, um, the costs related to, uh, I would say, CAPEX and OPEX costs, uh, not only in the, uh, in the hydrogen stream, but also in the chemical stream. So this cost sharing allow uh, a decrease of the cost quota of the, uh, of the hydrogen and might in principle allow to break uh, the barrier of 1.5 uh, euros per kilogram of produced, uh, of produced hydrogen. Of course, this is a lab stage uh, research. We are not uh, quantifying TRR. We might say that we are more or less between two and three. And uh, there are many research actions to be carried out to, uh, to drive this technology. Uh, to a level where we can consider the possibility of uh, a consistent uh, exploitation. But indeed, there are many opportunities to do this. What is most important now is the energy return of the invested energy of the, uh, of the biomass we use as feeding for the system, because uh, the higher the hair away of the, of the biomass, uh, the better uh, is the uh, system uh, efficiency in storing the, uh, the energy, the hydrogen energy, the, the energy in hydrogen. Uh, the other very important point, I think, is uh, that this system might even operate at pressure uh, higher than 350 bars, actually reducing the cost and the energy input of the compression stages for, uh, for hydrogen. And uh, there is also the need to work much on the uh, chemical purification from the, uh, from the reformate. Actually, these activities are uh, more or less ongoing and we, are, we have a research proposal already submitted to the uh, European Commission for, uh, for evaluation that actually want to address exactly this, uh, exactly this, this question. The most important steps toward uh, an exploitation actually are the analysis of the integration of the chemical reforming with the uh, renewable energy production, because we know much about the behavior of conventional electrolysis when coupled with wind and photovoltaics and steel, this is uh, somewhat an issue. Then uh, we must consider I mean, the electrochemical reforming technology at the light of the uh, current uh, regulation and the potentially future uh, framework for hydrogen production and even for the materials we use to fabricate the electrochemical reformer. I think one of the most relevant points is the uh, analysis of the feed feedstock characteristics. I mean, uh, especially the purity of the biomass uh, derived compounds and then also the flexibility to a different feedstock, because um, it, we might operate the system with different feedstock depending on the, on the offer that the market has. And uh, in some cases, we might also use this system as a water electrolyzer, is, even if the feedstock uh, is, not, uh, is not available. Uh, then uh, we must, of course, work to, uh, to integrate the process, you know, of course, and uh, uh, both uh, on the side of the feedstock and the products. So how to treat both. So what is the pretreatment pre for the feedstock and the post-treatment for the, for the products? And the other very important point we must pursue is the life cycle assessment and the social life cycle assessment 
of these new uh, electrochemical uh, electrochemical technologies. So we have uh, to work much on the side of the engineering now, uh, scaling up the system to uh, to the scale of more demonstrator to make a precise quantification of the uh, heat and mass balances, heat, uh, sorry, energy and mass balances in the system, and also uh, making consideration of what the uh, final plant uh, would like uh, to be. Uh, so uh, what component should be uh, head to, to the system and how we should uh, operate it. Well, uh, that's pretty much uh, of, uh, of the state of the electrochemical reformer. Uh, we have been working much in the last 10 years on this, and we published more or less uh, 10 papers on, uh, on the subject. I would like to put the attention especially on this paper of uh, 2000, uh, I mean 2014, which should be um, here, it's number 10, because this was the first energy calculation on the system and demonstrated then under uh, proper physical characteristics, this electrochemical reforming might be uh, maybe a more energy efficiency efficient than, than water uh, electrolysis. And we started from that point and uh, we uh, consider that uh, eventually using a biomass feedstock, uh, we might reduce the size of the renewable energy plant that supply uh, the uh, energy for clean hydrogen production to the, uh, to the electrochemical reformer, this in comparison to uh, water electrolysis. So if we consider only the electrical energy we supply to the system, we can consider that our uh, renewable energy plant can be uh, somewhat 50% smaller compared to water electrolysis at even hydrogen uh, productivity. So that's the group that delivered this research in the last 10 years, and these are uh, the most relevant collaborators and sponsors in the uh, in the research we have uh, performed. So thank you very much, William, for giving me uh, the opportunity to deliver this talk. It's it's very important, I think, to uh, to start to draft the uh, characteristic of these technologies, um, even in the concept context of the. Um, petroleum engineering, because I think uh, we also need to integrate the competencies uh, in those fields to uh, to be successful in exploiting this uh, groundbreaking groundbreaking uh, devices. So that's it. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, yes, obviously you, you you understand the issue. I mean, what we are trying to do as SP is to improve. The technicality we have the skill in terms of the conventional fossil fuel development at the same time to fill the gap in order to have people and skill ready for the new technologies uh, which are related to energy transition which is the one because actually the energy transition is one of the main uh, target that uh, the let's say the old oil company actually our energy integrated company are facing with as uh, Francesca shows during her presentation. Okay, now we are moving to uh, the question and answer page. We got some questions here. Uh, so, for uh, uh, Stefano, uh, one question is uh, about your presentation in a, in a slide that was a uh, uh, something where you talk about the uh, the fact that some figures in reality are more positive were, were are more positive than what the the outlook and the forecast uh, was supposed to reach. So, well, which is the reason? Because maybe the, the operators that are trying to make the the outlook usually are not so uh, let's say positive thinking. Or because there was a misunderstanding of which was the development of that scenario in terms of energy transition. 
Okay, thanks for the question. Uh, let me just try to put on the screen the, the, the slide uh, while answering. So the reason is economical and the projections uh, are based on the, the levelized cost of electricity or in the case of storage, levelized cost of storage. So uh, the levelized cost of electricity is something that depends upon mainly upon the capital expenditure of uh, the technology, how much solar module cost, how much a wind turbine cost, uh, how much uh, lithium based uh, cell uh, cost. And this is usually uh, basically the projections in each point of time in the last years were based on uh, an evolution of uh, cost of the technology cost that was uh, you know, projected uh, um, according to historical data. And what happened was that uh, the reality has outperformed the projections. So the cost went down quicker uh, than, uh, uh, than the projections, so therefore reducing the levelized cost of electricity for solar and wind, and uh, as such, you know, making those alternative sources of power more viable uh in uh, more places in the world including places that normally you know would have less sun or less wind or places where the cost of uh, the grid the electricity on the grid is actually cheap because there is a lot of coal to be used that's the case of china or india so even in those geographies thanks to the cost reductions of solar and wind the renewable energies have picked up quite dramatically and more than expected so it's a pure economic game here and uh uh, and it's true that um, uh, that in the past, that 10 years ago, there were subsidies. So someone may think about subsidies that have initially driven the deployment of solar and wind. Yes, but even in the case of subsidies, it was very interesting. The subsidies used to go down. Even today, they go down. But they used to go down over time because the regulator, the policymakers, knew that the cost of one solar cell actually goes down over time. Uh, they didn't know how the cost would go down when they made uh, the, the lows. So they imagined that every six months in Italy, for example, the, the filling tariff, uh, we're talking about 2010, 2011, every year the filling tariff would uh, be reduced. And guess what? The market simply boomed because the filling tariff, despite the fact they were already reducing in the mind of the policymakers, uh, they actually were very rich, so much rich because the actual cost of solar went down more than expected, uh, then the market boom. And there was a bubble in Europe in 2010, 2011. It actually was counterproductive because then sparked the government. The government got scared and decided to cut off everything. Some governments did it in an orderly way, like Germany, some other governments did it in a less orderly way, like Spain and Italy, but all governments basically backed down. And this has created some, you know, uh, shortfalls in the market uh, that were picked up by other places in the world thanks to the economics of the underlying technology so whenever europe phased out of you know being one of the largest player in the market in 2012 13 14 uh, then china us uh, chile south africa uh, other parts of the world basically decided to, to uh, massively installed out of pure out of economic reasons so it's just a uh, uh, Levelized cost of electricity that drives this. I hope that answers. Oh, yes. I think just one from my side, from my uncle, just, uh, just my curiosity. Do you think there is possible to make some lesson learned about this uh, difference we, we meet from the actual and the forecast that we had in the past? Or it's just uh, it depends every time. It just depends that we have to hope to, to reach the, the real. Uh, Output. Lessons learned. No, the lessons learned. I, I try to. I try to 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 conceptualize earlier. Uh, for me, the biggest lessons learned is that uh, we shouldn't be waiting for uh, this miracle. You know, we shouldn't be waiting for the Messiah. We shouldn't be waiting for uh, something that has not yet come, because if we actually stick to what is existing, electric cars with lithium-based batteries, lithium-ion batteries, 
you know, in three years from now, the range of cars will be 1,000 kilometers, and uh, we're going to charge them in 20 minutes, uh, 80% or even less. So, uh, if if there is any lessons learned from from the past 12, uh, 10, 20 years, sorry, is that incumbent techno by incumbent I mean dominant dominant technologies. Uh, that actually have got the favor of banks and have got the favor of institutional investors and have got the favor of electric utilities and have got the favor of oil and gas players, you know, are bound to get better and always get better simply because there is a tremendous amount of money thrown at them. So why are we going to drive electric cars in five years from now, all of us, if we're not already driving electric cars, because all the car manufacturers will only produce electric cars and they are throwing a massive amount of money to, to these electric cars. So now I'm looking at the situation purely from a, a business, let's say, a, investing perspective you know uh, I, I studied electronics uh, in university and there is a famous uh, uh, moore's law in, elec in electronics that says that you know every 18 months the cost of uh, uh, one byte or one transistor basically uh, is reduced by half or basically you can stuff a double amount of transistor on the same chip in 18 months and i was discussing this when i was at berkeley doing my thesis uh, in silicon valley next to silicon valley and someone told me, you never know if this is actually an empirical law or if the R&D spending of IBM labs and all the uh, Intel and all the other uh, silicon fabs and silicon, uh, semiconductor companies were actually sized according to the Moore's law. So the Moore's law was a self-fulfilling expectations in reality because all the companies were actually sizing their R&D spending to actually be on track to the Moore's law. So is the Moore's law true? or it's simply a good representation of reality on which business people actually can get a sense and can decide on spending money. And I tend to think for renewables, uh, that's what is happening. It's a bit of a uh, self-fulfilling expectation. Once people in, in finance, uh, you know, private equity, private credit, banks, uh, uh, corporates, large corporates, uh, are comfortable about those uh, dominant technologies, they will stick to them because they work and uh, they are reliable and there is a downside protection and uh, and this will continue to improve. So I wouldn't bet personally that I will, in 10 years from now, I will be driving a car with a completely different battery technology. I think in 10 years from now, the car I will be driving will be based on lithium ion batteries, just if I have to drive, derive a lessons learned, but uh, I can be completely wrong. <laughs> so uh, another question I think it's good for you even for Francesca uh, is about how can you reorienting investment considering the disruptive situation we are facing with all this changing in the last two years where you know the system is pushing to move from one technology to another who wants to push them uh, from one technology or another it's more a matter of economy as you were saying or is a matter of which is the, the backbone technology we have. So at the end, we have it's technology driving the investment or it's policy orienting investment. So as a capital investor from one side, on the other side, uh, Francesca was talking about the investment that a company is trying to address to different technology. If policy change, which are the techniques you can use to re reorganize your, let's say, business plan and to move it was simple to move money in this way. So maybe let's start with uh, Francesca just to, to give to Stefan a bit of a relax. Uh, Francesca, you're on mute, I think. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, th thank, you for, th thank you for the question. It's it's obviously complex. I mean, there's no single solution to to energy, and uh, even if you talk of renewables, there are different renewables uh, suited for different climate conditions, wind uh, in some places and solar in other places, and uh, they are here to, here to stay, and uh, they will attract investments. We are also investing in in, uh, in big projects and in solar and wind, uh, and offshore wind, for instance. Uh, and if we talk of new uh, new actors in the energy space, we are still talking of of uh, scientific results which are, have been known for 
for 70 years, if we're talking about fusion. It's, uh, on the other hand, it's technology which hasn't been developed to, to, um, to the, the, the status of, of uh, industrial deployment. But uh, all, the, all, all the, the different actors in the, in the energy space, once they get there, they are there, there to stay. Um, obviously, we hope that the, the, the most uh, gas, uh, climate change uh, forms of energy will, uh, will, will reduce uh, in time, but we, we are not yet seeing that. For instance, so it's a, it's a combination of technology, investment, and and needs, or, or apart from opportunities. So um, I would say there's no 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 unique solution. Uh, I've talked about fusion because we think it's possibly a game changer, but there are things to be done uh, in that in that area which uh, we know uh, still, still need to be to be addressed. Whereas uh, renewables can do a good job. Although they have the the intermittency as as a limitation, and uh, uh, that has to be uh, factored in in whatever project you do, it's a combination of technology, opportunity, and and financing. Thank you, Stefan. If you want to add something from your side as investor, um. I, I can add something personally. I would be the happiest person on earth if uh, fusion will work on an industrial scale. As uh, as uh, as we heard, uh, the industrial the, the physics principle are known, and it works. It's just a question of making the the the, the business work uh, based on a technological breakthrough, uh, but basically able to 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 get to a levelized cost of electricity that will be compatible with. Uh, uh, with what we see today, I mean, with today's prices of electricity, anything is compatible. So let's say in two years from now, and, um, uh, and the same applies uh, to hydrogen. It's in a similar struggle, you know, green hydrogen uh, to get down to a levelized cost uh, that is, uh, you know, two dollar per, uh, per per kilo or, or whatever it will be. Um, so uh, no, I from from an investor perspective, I can only say that uh, you know f traditional nuclear. It's a long-standing discussion. I don't know if it's good to open it up now, but traditional nuclear. Yes, uh, it's, not, uh, you not, can do this. Uh, not continue. fusion, but fission or fissile or whatever it's called in in in, in English. Uh, traditional nuclear has failed the economic test. Not uh, the the rest. I mean, nu traditional nuclear. I want to say traditional uh, as uh, consistently deliver a positive learning curve. Positive meaning that the cost per output has historically increased. So the construction of reactors is taking more time than expected. It's always uh, going. Uh, uh, above budget, that the cost of electricity of those reactors is much higher than expected. No insurance companies uh, insure reactors, no banks uh, finance the reactors. Uh, so this has to be always done with state guarantees. So it's basically on taxpayers' money. Uh, and uh, basically, it works. It's CO2 free. There is a little problem with the waste, but, uh, but there, it's, 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 it's a CO2 free for sure. The problem is that today you start building a reactor. It takes you 10 years uh, to convince the people that you're going to build a reactor there. And after 10 years to build it, you're going to run uh, over cost. So an investor looks into this. He doesn't look into if the technology is cool or not. And, uh, you know, again, I can be the, uh, the best fan of, of nuclear, but until uh, the levelized cost of electricity is not there where it needs to be, there are alternatives and I will not invest in uh, Nuclear. So when venture capital invest in uh, breakthrough technologies in fusion nuclear, they expect the breakthrough to bring the levelized cost of electricity to a level that basically will allow nuclear to compete. And at that point, it will be a game changer. Yes, because it will be baseline source. And uh, now, is it worth pursue 100%? And it has to be pursued, obviously, uh, with all possible means. Would I invest all my pension money into this? No, 
I prefer that my pension money is invested, you know, in Apple stocks and uh, in the, in the wind parks uh, in uh, in Germany, and maybe just a little bit into into betting on uh, on uh, on on the the new reactors of the future. So that's why you have these different scales that I was trying to to show uh, at the beginning, and uh, and that's why if we have today just to draw a line and say, okay, imagine no technological breakthrough come through come which is obviously uh, impossible, but uh, just hypothetically, then today, uh, you know, you can uh, go to net zero uh, by deploying more of the usual. And then if something happens to the good, then net zero is going to be easier. And we all hope this is going to happen from nuclear and from uh, also direct capture uh, DAC uh, and also from uh, green hydrogen. All is needed. I mean, I think we heard it uh, uh, earlier. Obviously, in the energy, the race to net zero, everything is needed. Really, everything. Clear, clear, clear your point. Thank you very much. Now we have um, another question. A question for Alessandro concerning the, the futuristic technology we have. So the question is: uh, Do you feel that? Uh, your technology is a, a booster or is it in competition with the traditional green hydrogen technology that today we are talking about? For realistically, I think it's 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 something that complements it. I, I would say that the most important products of this technology is Uh, consider that if you uh, supply the system with uh, with ethanol and you produce acetic acid, for each kilogram of hydrogen you get more or less ten kilogram of acetic acid. So um, same ratio you can find with other compounds. So it's it's more or less a system that can work uh, as a tool, I think, of the biorefinery. Uh, and can complement uh, green hydrogen production, delivering um, some new business model for it that may uh, make this uh, this hydrogen uh, a little cheaper, but cheap sharing the cost uh, with um, with the chemical stream. But uh, this depends very much. I mean, on on the size of the chemicals, uh, on the size of the market of the chemicals we are going to. Uh, we are going to produce, of course. Uh, acetic acid is produced, I think it's 18 megaton um, per, per year. And uh, so it's pretty large market. There are also a uh, very, very large market for uh, acrylic acid and other uh, monomers for bulk polymers production. So uh, in that case, this hydrogen, I think, can be uh, I mean, electrochemical forming can be considered as a tool for uh, even for the production of green, green hydrogen that can be uh, delivered for transportation or even uh, as clean hydrogen um, as a reactant for further chemical processes uh, in the context of the um, decarbonized uh, decarbonized refinery but i think it's 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 a compliment you know uh, you it, it will uh, be uh, aside and eventually uh, we can have system that can work as both uh, i mean systems that can use biomass when is uh, i mean uh, uh, biomass feedstock when is available and and work as electrolyzer when uh, no biomass is uh, is present so this could work for um, for it, but I, I'm not meaning that we are going to deploy electrochemical reforming at the terawatt scale by 2050. Okay. So there are another few questions for you, just because you're on your with your uh, microphone. Uh, so the first is, uh, which are I think something already respond. Uh, which are the contests in which uh, the technology can be uh, maximizes efficiency. And uh, the other one is uh, which is the energetic balance that you foresee for the process? Okay, ah, uh, well, uh, okay, uh, let's start with, with the first one uh, that the was the context. context. 
the mm. content. Uh, well, uh, I see uh, that uh, we might see uh, installation in places where uh, these biomass sources are really available. So um, we know that uh, photovoltaics or wind energy uh, is very close uh, to, very near to um, uh, agri-food uh, production, you know, agriculture. So uh, it, it might be interesting to exploit the um, scraps of this uh, agri-food production for feeding the electrochemical reformer in this in this context. So I think the technology can be pretty flexible in terms of feedstock. Uh, so it can be uh, deployed in, in different contexts uh, where uh, different sources of biomass uh, can uh, can be available, or eventually even glycerol from uh, biodiesel biodiesel production. But there is a big but here. And this but is all about the, um, I mean, uh, the fact that we have not yet completed uh, any uh, very deep analysis on the uh, purity of the of the feedstock and the effect they have in the uh, in the process. So at the present stage, we are at the lab scale, uh, demonstrating the concept and uh, with uh, pretty uh, pure uh, compounds and we see that it works. Uh, so we might ask what is the dependence of the performance of the device if the purity of this compound is lower. So we need probably to find a trade-off and this is part of the next stages of the research. Uh, so uh, the, um, I mean, short-term uh, target is to demonstrate uh, the technology with a, a small demonstrator with one kV uh, of energy supply and uh, also testing all the balance of plant and all the uh, possible purities we can get from the different feedstock and the effect they have. And also, I mean, the energy and um, economic inputs needed to uh, carry out the um, chemicals purification from the exos reformate. So, we are we are working on this, and that's that's what we uh, we will uh, do next to pave the way toward uh, toward exploitation. On the other side, uh, on the side of energy, the situation is of course very complex because uh, it must be considered in terms of um, uh, efficiency of the system. Uh, so, if I feed my system with some uh, kind of biomass suits. I should consider uh, what is the energy con content of this source. So in the presentation, I discussed uh, shortly uh, the effect of the energy return of the invested energy of the biomass in the system. And what we demonstrated actually is that this system gets, um, I mean, this green hydrogen in energy uh, terms become competitive with uh, the green hydrogen from water electrolysis when uh, the biomass supply uh, as an energy return of the invested energy uh, of the order of four. So if it's above four, uh, the system is okay. Um, any improvement in the system efficiency, I mean materials, electrocatalysts, and uh, balance of plants and whatever, uh, will for sure uh, lower this uh, lower this value. So uh, that's pretty much the situation. And the preliminary data we have are pretty encouraging. So uh, we know that uh, biomass feedstock with this characteristic exists. I would not use, for instance, the ethanol from corn for doing this because the um, energy return of the invested energy is very questionable and very close to one. But from other sources, such as sugarcane, it could work, for instance, or even from uh, second generation bioethanol, uh, this might be uh, might be uh, competitive. Okay, thank you, Alessandro. Welcome. And, uh, we have a question for uh, Francesca. Uh, 
So Francesca, we, which are um, from your side, from your view, the main challenging, main challenge you, you face during the development of this uh, high technology and complex project? Uh, the challenges are more related or addressed to supply chain availability of skills, investment, or relationship between the several stakeholders which are involved in the development of this project. Just give a priority of what you see, which, which I think is what you're trying to handle and manage every day. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the question. Uh, no, the, the, there are different classes of challenges, of course. The, the obvious ones are, are technical. Um, there has been quite a deal of progress in the, in the field of fusion in the last 18 months all over the world. Uh, but we are still not there. I mean, uh, we have to keep a, a plasma stable at uh, 100 million degrees for 8,000 hours a, a year uh, and extract the heat and, uh, and be able to, to breathe the, the tritium, which is one of the fundamental parts of the fuel. Uh, each of these parts has a challenge, uh, which is technical. Then there's a supply chain uh, Theme as well, because of course, um, to be uh, to be scaled uh, at industrial scale, um, you need a supply chain which is robust and with uh, um, with uh, with a number of vendors and uh, and uh, and all the materials that uh, that are required. So each of these parts is a challenge in in in, in itself. And then, of course, they all have to fit together. So you, <laughs> you need a, a system of systems to, to work all, all together. So we are doing all this, and we are doing it in cooperation with the stakeholders. So with CFS, with Penair, with uh, with Academy, with the, uh, with, with MIT, uh, and with other other industry, other industrial actors, uh, which are contributing to. To, to DTT, for instance, or uh, in the supply chain for, for both DTT and CFS. So uh, each of these points is, is a challenge, and at least we know what we are looking for. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is clear. It's not to say that it's going to be easy, but uh, it's, it's the right moment to do that. Thank you. Uh, so I would like to ask just the last question to. to... All of you, all the speaker, which is a general question about it, our Italy. So uh, the question is: Looking at Italy, which is, in your opinion, which in your opinion can be the three most important enablers, enablers to accelerate the energy transition. So according to what you see today in terms of technology, what can be the one that can boost our energy transition in Italy, especially the Italian environment? That's a very challenging question. If, if I may, we already have a set of technologies and we already have know how to work, make them work. Of course, there's new technology coming on board. But I think one of the main things in Italy is accelerating the permitting and the regulator times and, uh, and uh, issues. I think this is one of the main factors because uh, I'm sure there's investment money to to to, to be used and uh, and technologies which are already ready to be used, but uh, I would say permitting is one of the key points. I don't know what my my colleagues think about this. It's okay. It's not more a matter of technology; it's a matter of the technology put in place in order to start business. Okay. And from uh, Alessandro, your point of view. Talk about technology, for instance. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a pure researcher, so oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not much into the, um, to the system uh, consideration. But uh, my personal feeling is that we must focus much on uh, uh, improving the penetration of electric vehicles in the, um, uh, in the society. Uh, because I, I still think there is a strong barrier uh, especially for those who want to, to change the car uh, and this barrier is on the cost. So uh, 
at present is still pretty hard. Also, I think uh, this would boost the creation of the infrastructure for the charging, which is another very important, another very important issue. So uh, these two elements, I think, would boost very much the, um, I mean, the, the energy transition because uh, it's true that electric cars uh, are getting commercial. But still, uh, the cost is pretty, pretty high. Maybe that the learning curve, and Stefano probably has a much better point of view than mine uh, on this, will, will improve much in the, in the next future. But if we don't have the possibility to recharge, uh, the, if, if we don't have a suitable um, recharging infrastructure, and if we don't abate uh, the cost to, uh, I mean, to, to get an electric car, it's very hard uh, to compete at the present at the present stage. We might be in a scenario where, I mean, we uh, force moving to to electric systems, but on the other side, people won't change uh, the old cars uh, because of the because of the cost. So, uh, th but this is just uh, I mean. No. It's there is no solution, we know. I agree with both. Yeah, permitting. I was already talking about electric cars. No, <laughs> permitting and uh, in the penetration of uh, uh, EVs, yes, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, because by the other side, we have the issue to produce all this. I can, I can share something funny, although I'm yeah. making cool. advertisement for a competitor of mine. This is a apparently a page of the Sole 24 Ore of uh, today, uh, it's on LinkedIn, so I don't know. I just shared the LinkedIn page. Just let me know if you can see it. Yeah. Uh, now, this is becoming a joke now. Uh, it's, uh, it's all the players in the sector are saying that uh, uh, um, permitting is the largest obstacle. At the moment, I mean, uh, auctions uh, for incentives are going under uh, uh, undersubscribed because there are no authorizations for uh, solar and wind. So uh, uh, clearly, that's uh, the, the a low hanging fruit. And regarding the EV charging, uh, yeah, the cost is uh, the, you know according to research the. The barriers for consumers are a battery driving range, uh, not enough places to charge, uh, and the cost. Those are the three biggest uh, barriers to the adoption of EV charging. I think Italy did a, a good job with uh, with infrastructuring, uh, um, you know, uh, the country before. Actually, people started buying uh, EVs, and this happened mainly through NLX and B Charge, that now is part of uh, ENI. Uh, so, uh, uh, the charging stations are there and I live in Switzerland, but whenever I go to Italy, they're always empty. Maybe not in Milan city center, but, uh, um, somewhere uh, I'm from Turin in Turin, they're empty always. Uh, I mean, the parking spaces are always empty. So it seems to me that the infrastructure is there. Obviously there is need to be a little bit more cars uh, to incentivize players to invest a little bit more in, uh, in the chargers. And uh, and probably yes, incentives on the on the cost would make. I also think the supply of vehicles is not uh, good enough yet, but it's gonna come. It's gonna come uh, uh, pretty soon. So uh, the combination of more renewables and more uh, EVs, uh, it's uh, definitely a powerful tool. Okay, I thank you to all of you speaker. Thank you very much for your presentation. And I think with this discussion, we, we have some vision of which can be some possible scenario of our future of energy. But at the same time, we're discussing about the problem we have today. <laughs> we are not able to put in place technology just to start to, to solve our problem today. So again, thank you very much. I thank also Spain International Italian Section and Gaia program that helps us to, to go on with this activity. And uh, I hope to see you in the next event we will have on May. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you for organizing. It's a pleasure. Thank you. It's a pleasure.
Hope to see you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. William.